Hello everyone, it's Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore here, and this is the Music Masterclass. Today is uh, October 13th, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, we're here to talk about making music, talking about composition, arranging, etc., and uh, thanks for checking in, and thanks for the uh, confirmation on sound, because you just never know, right? Um, so, uh, with any luck, we're going to be uh, looking at Rod Woodhouse's uh, symphony piece that he's been working on. Kind of came to a place and said, okay, I think I'm done for now, and I would love to take a look and see where it is. I know, Rod, you've been having some uh, computer issues and other issues, but I see you are here, so that's fantastic. And in a few moments, I'll bring you on. Um, I do just, uh, and, and of course... I guess we don't know for sure if you're going to have uh, sound and all that going on. So let me let me just go ahead and invite you now, and then we'll just maybe leave you, you know, so you can test your sound and all. Um, and mic, I mean your your mic and camera, and then uh, when we're ready to go, we'll uh, we'll go. So, um, so you are here. I see a, a something. I don't know if that's live or if that's just a photograph. Um, but something is there for you, Rod. Not hearing yet. Oh, something's happening. Something is happening. Now your your camera is live. Can you, you hear me? Mind? Yep, I hear you just fine. Cool. Oh, thank heavens. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, so I'm going to ask you just to uh, kind of mute and or turn off your camera just for the mo just for a moment while I just say a few other words, and then then we'll just bring you right back. Okay. All right. So, um, what uh, I just I just want to get a few things out of the way first to talk about, um, and uh, then we'll look at Rod's piece. So, um, one of the things that I want to make sure that uh, I follow up on it has to do with what I did in the cafe yesterday. Uh, in the cafe yesterday, I showed some things in MuseScore 4 as far as using VST key switches and all. One thing I didn't do that I want, I want to make sure I point out is that once you've added all those key switch things in there, then you hide that staff. This is something that wasn't possible in MuseScore 3. You couldn't hide just individual staves of an instrument, but you can in MuseScore 4, and that's what you're going to want to do is hide the, all those ugly low notes. So anyhow, that was just one thing I wanted to make sure I set up out loud while I'm thinking of it. Um, and other thing that I want people thinking about in the background while Rod and I talk about is just a few things about uh, what you want, what you want. I'm, I'm going to keep doing like surveys every once in a while and asking, you know, what kinds of things can I do to uh, provide more value to you? And as I'm planning the MuseScore 4 course, you know, I want to some ideas about that, any, any ideas anyone has. But also, uh, and these are all things you can be putting in the chat at any point, but I'll come back and ask later also. But also, there's a couple other things that I want to ask about. One has to do with things like the Musicianship Skills Workshop and the Music Engraving Workshop, where, you know, there are people participating, but maybe not as many, as, as much participation as, as there could be. And I want to know, well, what could I do to uh, make that more valuable for you? <laughs> That's the question. And last question that I want you thinking. So one question, MuseScore 4 course, what might, you know, what, any ideas on? Second is musicianship skills and music engraving. What might make those more useful for you? The third thing is we're coming close to that time of year where last year I launched that jazz piano holiday course. And yeah, I want to do something like that again. My question for anyone who feels like uh, weighing in on this is, what does that mean? Does it literally mean doing jazz piano again? Or might it mean doing some other kind of arrangement of holiday songs? Um, does it have to be holiday songs? Would you just want a jazz piano thing as a separate thing? Um, so that's something that's on my mind because if I, I want to start putting that together relatively soon also. So those are just some things that I want people thinking about uh, but, you know, don't think about it so hard that you don't pay attention to what Rod and I are talking about. They're just some things to uh, to uh, have in mind. Um, and then if anyone can remind me after uh, we, we look at Rod's piece here, if there's time left, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about perseverance. 
So perseverance.、Uh, remind me, tell story about perseverance.、Um, okay. So Rod, you're here. You've got a working computer. You've got a working camera. You've got a working microphone, and you uploaded your score. So lots of successes. There's some perseverance for you right there. Did it work? So the score is there, but I still can't download it, and I have no idea why. So、um, all I can do, and I'm going to do this for everyone's benefit, because I know it comes up often that there'll be a score that、uh, I would want to be able to download and can't, and I'm just going to show, just in case it's、um, something. Uh, that is there, and you're just not seeing. I'm just going to show you with one of my own scores. So this is apparently the most recent score I have. Okay, fine. That can't literally be true, but it's what showed up first. This is one of my scores on MuseScore.com. When I click the dot 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 here, and it says update this score, and we scroll down to the bottom, there's a box here that says disable the score download. If you see that box, make sure it is not checked. If you don't see that box, that's probably kind of the problem right there. And I have no idea. And I would love if if anyone has figured out why sometimes this box just doesn't show up. I suspect it has to do with. Whether or not you have said that this is your own original composition or not, at at the top step there, maybe it has to do with what copyright settings you have here. I don't know, but this box should be there and it needs to be unchecked. I did notice、um, when I was working on it an hour ago, when I did all the work this morning, that when I uploaded it, the thing was I hadn't done it; it was ticked off, and I unchecked it. Uh huh. Oh, I don't know、good. why I was checked because I didn't do it. Yeah,、um, and I and unfortunately I just don't know much about how MuseSquare dot com、mm -hmm. works their stuff, so I don't know. But you unticked it, and yet it still when I try to download it, it still tells me access denied. So、mm -hmm. I just don't know.、Um, but that's fine. We're going to work with it right here, and we can do that. So、um, I what I wish was the case was like I would like that to zoom. On the computer, it doesn't work. I would like when it goes full screen if I could then zoom from here, but that doesn't work.、Um, <laughs> but what I can do is zoom in with my actual browser, not while I'm full screen, but I can use my browser here to just zoom in every once in a while when I need to see something better. So that's going to be what I'm going to do as necessary. And yeah, we'll just、uh, talk about what we can talk about. So before I hit play on this, I've heard bits of it in different stages of it. I haven't actually listened to this version of it all the way through yet.、Um, I don't know if this is different than the one you downloaded a couple days ago or not,、um, but this、um, is the one that that you just posted. Yes, it, it's effectively not no different. It's just that、okay. when I I had to upload it eight bars at a time to try and get rid of the error that it had in it. Hmm. I still don't understand what that was all about, but I've lost some of the the settings, and it's not set up in a page properly, and it's the, the notes are right, but it's a bit messy. Okay,、and、I've lost a I lost a few ties and things like that. Ah, all right. So,、um, one thing that I I did just comment, I did respond to your thing about the corruption, and gave you a link to the article that tells you the things you、right. can do to try to fix it. Any time, and this is also good information for everyone out there. When you open a score and it says this score is corrupt, what should I do? And it'll tell you if you click on the details button, it'll tell you, oh yeah, this measure's got too many beats in it or too few beats in it. Um, and then there's a button that says ignore, and if you press ignore, it'll load it anyhow. But then you want to fix those problems, and there is an article, and and here's how I find that article. I find this article the same way every time. I type into my search bar, MuseScore fix corruption, and、wow. the very first score, the very first hit that comes up is the official how-to article on all the things you can do to try to fix those corruptions. And you want to do that because those corruptions mean now there's too many beats in a measure or too few beats in a measure, and not in a good way. I mean, you're allowed to increase the number of beats in a measure. You go to measure properties and do that, but 
these are cases where there's more beats than even measure property says there should be or fewer beats yeah. and what it's going to mean is at some point mu score is going to crash because <laughs> it's going to get confused by the missing or extra beats so it's like a ticking time bomb when you see the corruption message so don't uh, don't take them lightly but copying into a new score is often a good solution and if that allowed you to get the job done then great so, Rod, other than that, then, so is this a, a good one then for me to try to play from as opposed to an earlier one? Is this the one we should be looking at? Oh, it's, it's my latest. It is the latest yeah. version. I haven't done anything since this. Okay. Um, but there's not an earlier version that trades one thing for another, like, oh, this, like the an earlier version is missing the last four bars, but it has the ties correct or something like that. Is there any reason I should look at an earlier version? No, because it's just ties. So it <clears throat> just means the playback has, you know, the, mm -hmm. I don't know, the clarinet playing the same note twice instead of holding it. That's all. Okay. All right. In that case, <clears throat> yeah, and I could see that'll happen if you're copying and pasting because it won't copy a tie if it extends past the uh, thing. So that's probably what happened. I've learned a lot about the, the yes. last 24 hours. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> what I want to do is hit play on this. I see it says it's three minutes long. Before I hit play on it, um, I've heard bits of it before. As mentioned, we've played parts of it before here, I think. Uh, what do you mm. want to tell us about it before we just go through and listen to it? Well, it's just an... Uh... I was just trying to experiment with sound and with um, working how a structure of a, a symphony works. I've got a lot to learn, but I think it's, I'm happy with how it's going because it's actually developing and it's moving along. I've got a lot of things to add and more time to, and as I say, it, maybe it needs another theme as well, um, but early days. Okay. Um, so let me actually do this so I can get this on the chat at the same time also, except that's going to make it too small to see. So I'm just going to make it full screen after all. Um, okay. Um, so, t but tell us a little more about like, um, you know, what was going on that caused you to start doing this? Uh, you know, what, you know, the, what, what led to the uh, creation of this? Where, where were you, where were your thoughts at? What were you doing that made you say, Hey, it's time to, time to write this symphony. Um, well, as I said, music was my life before life got in the way. Right. <laughs> uh, when I was younger. <laughs> and I, I've come back to this at the age of 75. So it's, um, I'm just learning how to write music and I'm learning how to understand the music that I didn't really understand when I was playing the piano as a teenager. And so, anything, any particular reason you chose to do a symphony? I mean, that's an ambitious thing to do. Um, but just learning how music works. I mean, all I, right. I, um, I can play the piano, but as I've said in other places, I only did it by rote and by um, muscle memory. I can't sight read, mm -hmm. which is an interesting thing in itself, isn't it? Yeah, although, you know, when you say sight read, I mean, like, you can look at a note and say, hey, that's a C, and then play the C. It's just yeah. that in practice, when you have a piece of music in front of you, it's too much information to process to actually be able to play the piece, right? Yeah, well, I tried uh, oh, 25 years ago, I tried to, to learn to play the flute. Hmm. And I can't even sight read a single note instrument. Ah. I mean, I can I can work out which note it is and play it, but I can't put them all but, together. I can't. Right. It's just, it's something about my brain that doesn't quite work. Well, I, I, I will challenge that and say it's a skill you haven't yet learned. That's right, I've done Because sight reading is, is, there's a lot of pattern recognition that goes on that's not supposed to be all this calculation of, oh, this note is on the fourth space, therefore every yeah. good boy does fine, and it's a this, and it's the, the note is like a dotted quote. There's a lot more big picture stuff that we eventually learn to see. But how you get there is still very mysterious. Like everyone's piano teacher, I think, goes through the same process of trying to show you one note at a time how to play. But there is a magic point at which you pass the looking at it one note at a time and start seeing the picture and seeing the bigger picture. And some people have probably figured out how to teach that um, or how to explain that. And I've made my attempts at it, but there is definitely a magic to it that um, is hard to put into words. But that's the thing that uh, that I would say is missing. You're probably looking too much one note at a time and not be and not seeing the forest. 
Um, yeah, I, I totally understand what he's saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. but my main thing about MuseScore is that it allows me to actually produce music, which I really I've got stuff in my head that I want to I want to put on the page, as it were. All right. All right. Well, and, then, go ahead. And you know, I did a string quartet when I first found MuseScore two years ago. I I decided to write something. And because I, I really not sure about how to write piano music, even though I could play the piano, I could never write piano music. So I figured a string quartet would be the way to go. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. uh, well, relatively. Yeah. <laughs> um, then I learned that I, uh, I was mucking around. I didn't understand the chord structures. So that's when I did your courses, all your, your harmony courses mm. and all the rest of it, which uh, I find fat, you know, it's really, I've learned a lot. Now this symphony here, I've now I think I've worked out how to do the harmonies by starting starting with the, a melody or some sort of line, and then working out the harmonies underneath it. And I think it came together better than the string quartet. You have to say. Okay. Well, then I'm uh, I, I'm feeling good about just uh, taking a listen to this, and then we can talk about individual pieces. Any any you know final for now thoughts before I go ahead and hit play? I'm having a ball. All right. Well, then uh, I'll suggest that you hit uh, the mute on your mic, and um, uh, I will kind of do the same. I, I have to remember. I can't. If yeah. I, anyhow, I got I got it under control. I'm gonna go ahead and hit play now. All right. And so everyone, uh, I hope you enjoy uh, Rod Symphony One uh, as it uh, as it exists right now. All right. Here we go.
Yeah, Dan, that is, I mean, uh, Rod, that is just lovely. Um, and yes, unfortunately, um, it does seem like MuseScore.com is struggling to keep up there, and I couldn't tell you why, but um, it was struggling to keep up and display things, but that's okay. Hopefully, as we look at little individual pieces of it, we'll get to understand more. It would have been too small <laughs> to understand the notes anyhow, but uh, we'll get to talk about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, that is just beautiful. I mean, when, when you first started it, there was a lot of potential, and you've really expanded on that nicely. Um, uh, so yeah, I took, a, I wrote down a few notes uh, about things that I want to um, <clears throat> point out about it. Uh, any questions that you want to ask me about, uh, you know, whether it's a music score question or just or a music question? No, oh, I think it's just a matter of um, that I'm experimenting with the different balances with in, between the instruments in the orchestra and how you're going to progress through the music. Um, what I did notice was that a lot of the um, balance settings that I had in that have been lost, it doesn't seem really balanced. Ah, all. okay. Um, yeah, so the whatever settings you made in the original score when you copied it into a new one, yeah, you'd have to redo that in the mixer probably. I understand so, that. <laughs> so one thing, and this, these, everything that I talk about is, um, uh, you know, I whenever I do these, I'm giving feedback directly to one person, but I expect that it's useful to lots of people. And so here's one thing everyone should know about balance. You can't trust that the balance you hear when you just write some music is what would <clears throat> is what it would sound like with real instruments, right? It might turn out that, like for instance, typically the trombones uh, if you write trombone parts, they might come out too loud in MuseScore's playback unless you pull it back. But it totally depends on how you're writing and what the other instruments are. There are so certain instruments that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to make it sound exactly how it's going to sound in real life. So you can use the mixer to make it work more the way you think it should go. On the other hand, you you have to realize that some things really are loud. And if you write something and it sounds a lot louder than everything else, yes, you could use the mixer to make it quieter, but maybe in real life it's going to be loud too. That is part of the skill of um, orchestration to me is uh, understanding balances. And yeah, it's one that is a trial and error process for me personally. So is there, uh, Rod, is there a particular aspect of the balance that um, you think was the, the sort of most significant thing that was off? Well, it was the trombones. Ah, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have never written for trombone before in my life. Uh -huh. and, I, and I thought, I've got to put them in there somewhere because there they are sitting in the orchestra doing absolutely <laughs> nothing. So, and I understand, and I've done a lot of research in the last week or so about orchestration. Um, so I'm learning a, a lot about how so an oboe and a bassoon or an oboe and a clarinet work and in the best registers and all that sort of stuff, stuff I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. So I've got a long way to go, and I'm not sure. I think I used, instead of the mixer to get the sound to sound right, bearing in mind I know that new score isn't the way it'll sound if an orchestra plays it, um, but I used the, um, you know, all of the dynamics instead gotcha. of the mixer. Well, and yeah, that should definitely be your start point. Your start yeah. point should be putting in the dynamics you yeah. think make sense, and then the mixer is for fine-tuning from there. Yeah, I can understand that. So, um, yeah, and even when I scroll here, it doesn't want to redraw this. Let me see if I like refresh the screen here, if it'll redraw better, because I don't L like it. Life's interesting, isn't it? I mean, this was all set up, and yet my and my computer crashed. I found out it was yeah. because my RAM my RAM died. Ah, and it it eventually just corrupted Windows, and it did all sorts of weird things. So it cost me a pretty penny to fix. Ah. <laughs> so so just RAM. Yes. Well, okay, so the, 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 that happens, but it's working better now? Oh, yeah, the computer's fine. It's Great. just um, I yeah. can't – I'm not sure what's happening with this download thing because uh, okay. I'll yeah. go back and – I will yeah. go back and do it again and reload it and get rid of all the, the previous ones and, gotcha. and start again. Okay. 
Yes. Well, speaking of the computer thing, um, some of you may remember me having mentioned every once in a while that I've got like, well, I've got several different computers that I use during these things, but the one that I had bought back in like February, that was going to be my faster computer that I would be able to do these broadcasts with fewer hiccups. It started, it, it almost instantly would like start crashing. It would crash in the middle of a stream or it would crash right before I was getting ready to start. And I had, I, and then I sort of gave up on it. I'm like, okay, I just, I just wasted $800. Um, and, uh, at some point recently, my wife said, well, you bought that at Costco, right? I mean, they should, they, they should honor like, oh, they should just give you your money back or get you a new one. And I checked and I had like, they don't do that for computers or a very limited time for computers, but it turns out it was still under warranty. So I sent it in for, I sent it in back to the manufacturer and got it back just a few days ago. And oh my God, it's like, where have you been? <laughs> it's like, oh my, it's like actually working now. I've been, it's been running for a week straight without crashing. And so I, I'm thrilled to know that sometimes computers can actually be fixed. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing thing when you have this like problem and then you send it in to someone and they're able to fix it. And for some reason, even though my, my career has centered around computers for a long time, uh, I still am always skeptical that computer problems can ever be fixed. <laughs> and, as, I, as I commented uh, in uh, somewhere, uh, the, nothing in life is free except new school. <laughs> yes. So, um, so one comment that I saw from Dave, and I think I actually want to com comment about this specifically, is I'm going to play this section leading into bar 49, because that's where Dave uh, mentioned specifically um, an interesting change. And I think I know where this is. I wrote it down by timing uh, rather than by um, measure number, because, of course, I couldn't see the measure numbers. Yeah, so that is where it goes into major. That's my my uh, um, my note in here, where it goes into major, because it's been in basically A minor all along, and now suddenly we're in C major, and yeah, that was beautiful. That felt like exactly the right amount of A minor before we hit the major, and it was just super welcome. That and that, as modulations go between relative major and relative minor, that kind of stuff comes for free. It doesn't take a lot of work to set up a a modulation, to, and you don't even have to change key signatures to make it happen. But it um it just really can you know just do wonderful things for the sound to go from minor to major or vice versa. So in your thinking about that, Rod, did you have like what? the versions that I heard previously didn't have that yet, right? Did you always know you're going to go to major at some point and you just hadn't gotten around to it yet? Well, I knew I, I knew C major was the relative major of A minor, so I, at least I knew that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I've learned a few things. No, I knew that's where I wanted to go. And it okay. was, I knew that I wanted to start off with this sort of modeling uh, contemplative A minor thing, and then I was going to lift it into a, a nice soaring C major. Great, because that, that's exactly the kind of thinking that is very useful to have and I think um, often doesn't have happen. And this is like the danger of using notation software is it's so easy to start putting notes onto the page and hear what they sound like. You get very wrapped up in what's going on moment to moment and you don't think ahead like, wait a minute, where am I actually going with this? What is this going to be doing? And it's possible to create music without that thinking ahead, but that sort of thinking ahead and having that big picture in mind, well, it's just like I talked about having big picture reading music. It's It allows you to really accomplish some things that you probably wouldn't uh, accomplish otherwise. So yeah, that was, I'm, that was a really welcome spot in the piece for me. Um, there was another spot before that that I want to comment on, and it was right about the one minute mark. So I'm, now I'm going to have to like click around and figure out where the one minute mark is. Okay, 42 seconds. All right, we're going to call it here. Okay, it's right here. This oboe mm, part here is lovely. So here comes the oboe.
So it's a melody that we've heard before, right? I mean, it is the, you know, basically your main theme that you've been working with in a slightly, you know, slightly modified version. This, to me, seems like one of those spots where that thing that I was just talking about of having a big picture could maybe uh, help things if you wanted to expand on this section, I think it would be very welcome. Like, I feel like I didn't get enough oboe. Okay. No, I, I'm not saying it's not loud enough. I'm saying it was such a lovely welcome sound to hear the oboe take over that melody that I, I wanted to hear, I wanted to hear it go on a little longer. Um, and this is one of those things where it takes when you're writing it, it takes like, you know, an hour to write those four measures or whatever. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm tired of that already. But it only took, you know, seven seconds to listen to it. So, you know, you always have to remember that the experience of the listener is very different than your experience as the composer. Yeah. There's yeah, always. I, yeah, go I, ahead. I just I. The way I write my music, this is just my instinct. I just feel oh, I got to put a line here, and I put in the over. It just needs that thing in there. And it, it happens. I don't know where it comes from because um, I didn't actually seriously think about that line. It just happened. Yeah, and it's good when those lines come up. And then the next trick is to take a step back and to say, yeah. "Oh, okay. Now that I have this, now what does that mean?" And when I talk about taking a step back. Um, I, I make analogies to art a lot because I do, I, some of you know, I do landscape painting, um, and, uh, something I enjoy. And the idea that you, you know, you put a stroke down and when you're looking at it, you're seeing it from up close, but then at every once in a while, you need to step back and look at it from 10 feet away to see how things are, are hanging together. And I, I feel like it's very much like that with music, that taking that step back, um, is, uh, is a very valuable thing to do. Okay. So the one other one other spot that I want to check out and just uh, see what's happening in is whatever's happening. Let's see, at two ten and then two twenty five are where I wrote down the things, and it's going to still not want to show me some pages, but I'm not just not going to sweat it. Here's two ten. So I'll tell you what I think is going on here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to play this passage right here. Ah, okay. So I was um, confused a little bit by the sound that I was hearing, um, but now that I'm seeing the score, I understand a little bit more. But here's what I here's what I, I am uh, am going to comment on. This trumpet part here is pretty high. It's not super high by jazz trumpet player standards, but jazz trumpet standards are about a fifth higher than classical trumpet standards. C is a crazy high note for classical players. It's not like you never write that note, but it's quite high. Whereas, you know, for jazz, it's like, okay, that's like a, a perfectly ordinary lead trumpet note. So this passage is on the high side, and it's going to be, it's, you have it marked mezzo piano, that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. That's it's, just to try and get the balance, but I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing yet, so yeah. I'm happy with that. So, but, but, so this is my comment, that yeah, the trumpet player is not going to be able to play that mezzo piano. Now, I, I shouldn't say isn't going to be able to. It's a much bigger challenge than you might expect. There are trumpet players I know who can play high and quiet, but it is not the norm. The norm is as the trumpet gets higher, it's going to get loud too. So playing this passage that high, that quietly is is asking a lot of a trumpet player. But it's not asking quite as much as what I thought you were asking, because first of all, this note, C, this is like uh, transposed here. So that, that note C sharp here is uh, a B concert. And what's happening here is the trumpet is above the violins right there, right? You've got concert pitch wise, this is an E, a G, and a B. And uh, so E, G, B, while the violins, right? So you've got the trumpet above the violins here, but then in the next measure, they swap. 
the trumpet is going while the violins are going. So, uh, so I, I didn't, my ear didn't pick up on the fact that they had swapped, and that's partially just a limitation of MIDI synthesizers with real instruments, it would be more obvious. But I thought you had written that high D for trumpet. I heard that high D and transposed for trumpet, that would have been an E, and that would have been totally no a no-go in an orchestra setting. That D concert would be completely out of the question for most orchestral trumpet players. So as it is, this idea that the, the trumpet starts off above the violins and then they switched, that solved the range problem for you because, yeah, the trumpet wouldn't have been able to play that line. But I wonder, it also then slightly confuses the notion of where the melody is in there. Is there, can you, can you remember back or think about anything about your process there and were you aware that you had done that crossing like that? Oh, I think I, I'd worked out that, that those two were working against each other. I was just wanting to, to try that sound mm -hmm. because I'd never tried a uh, high trumpet with, with in an orchestra situation anyway. Uh, okay. Not that I know anything about trumpet playing, but it wasn't wasn't red, so I thought, well, it's grey, it's all right. No, oh, yeah. Knowing that that's not necessarily the answer. Yeah, well, but it, it 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 it's it's not red because it's playable. The C sharp, I think it considers D, uh, written D to be the highest note for trumpet. In, and for classical players, that would be about as high as you'd ever want to go. Um, so this C sharp is within the range. The C sharp is actually arguably harder to play than the D, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if there's any trumpet players here um, who could speak to that. Um, I, I, we don't typically have a lot of uh, brass players here other than Heiss, and he's at the other end of the range. But I, I understand that the high D, I think, is an open note, and C sharp is like, probably two valves down and it's it, you're playing it off of a different partial and it might be the case that this C sharp like I know that's I, I get that feedback about F sharp versus G that a high G on a trumpet is actually easier for for jazz lead players than the high F sharp um, so Steinark if you if you can comment about that is that C sharp actually in any way uh, harder to significantly harder than the C, or is it at all harder than the D above it? Is there anything about that C sharp that makes it a little bit awkward um, is something I'm curious about. But yeah, what I was really drawn to here was I love the sound of that high trumpet, and as a jazz person writing, working in big band context, high trumpets are always a thing, um, but it, it, it definitely surprised me to have the violins then rise above it. Um, uh, so, yeah, and, and Steiner's commenting that, uh, as you get high, what's happening is you're up the upper end of the, uh, harmonic series, and you can pretty much play just with your lips. <laughs> and that's the Baroque trumpet thing of just basically skipping the valves and just squeezing your lips tight and play hard. Yeah, so I thought that was true about the C sharp. Thanks for, thanks for confirming that. I thought that that might be the case. Um, so anyhow, this this is not an easy part you, you've written here, Rod. Is the bottom line, right? I, so, I understand. I understand that it, it's possible a lot of these things don't really work in the real world. What what I thought was instead of that trumpet high, I could drop it an octave and then throw something on top of it, even even a high bassoon, and then yeah. get that same feel. Yeah, because the thing is, there is a sound of associated with putting an instrument at the top of its range. That's that is a very you know, it's it can be a very appealing sound because there's a certain strain and music is all about, you know, this tension and release and there is a certain tension that comes from pushing an instrument to its limits that the ear responds to. So having instruments pushed towards the top of their range, if it works balance-wise, can produce, you know, very poignant sounds. So this has the potential to work well, but so does what you just said, having it an octave lower in a bassoon. That C, sh oh, that's a high B, um, right? So this is a B concert, down an octave, B. That is like, okay, if you know the beginning of Rite of Spring, yep, yep. it's all about that, that B. That, yep. So if you, if you know, so the sound of that opening, now you know what the B sounds like on bassoon. It's the sound of that B. Yep. So, so anyhow, um, 
there was one other co uh, specific spot that I wanted to just comment on, and I think it's basically must be about this flute melody here. Let me see what it is, because now I didn't write down what what I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, it's not about the flute melody itself. It's what you've done here of breaking down your orchestra into a much smaller ensemble here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, love it. More of that. Uh, that's always welcome, these big textural changes. And that's the thing you can tell just by kind of looking at the score and you see, oh, look at all those empty measures. Obviously, this is a, a broken down texture. And here it's a broken down texture, but it's got all the violins playing. It's got all the strings playing. And so it, even though hardly anyone else is playing, as long as the strings are in, it still sounds like the full orchestra. When the strings drop out, that's when we're aware, hey, what's going on here? The strings are missing. Actually, now the entire page is missing, but that's just <laughs> MuseScore.com being MuseScore.com. So the strings are the only instrument in the orchestra that you typically might expect to have play virtually throughout the piece. And because no, winds, you just don't ask that of them. And and so the, the sound that we are used to in orchestral uh, music is mostly string heavy, the strings always being present. And when they're not there, it really makes an impression. So that that section made it an impression on me very successfully. Well, that think. was deliberate. Yeah, that, good job. Good job. Love it. I, I'm just wondering whether this really isn't a symphony. This is more a, um, well, you know, a Baroque thing. It's, it's much smaller. Well, okay, so that is... A, a, a separate discussion that now we can have. What Well, what does it mean to call something a symphony? There yeah. is the traditional classical definition of what it means to be a symphony. It's a work in several movements of which the first movement has certain characteristics, the second movement has different characteristics, the third one has different characteristics, the last movement has different characteristics, maybe there's five, and it's not like there's one exact blueprint. Just like there's not exactly one blueprint for a house, there's lots of different houses out there, but somehow if you look at an office building, you can look at it and say, yeah, that's not a house, right? There's, even though there's a lot of different houses out there, somehow you can tell an office building is not a house because it's just, they don't build houses that way. So there's a lot of different kinds of symphonies, but there's certain kinds of pieces that you look at and go, yeah, but that's not a symphony. So this is written for a symphony orchestra. Whether or not you want to call it a symphony versus, you know, something else gets down to this matter of, well, are you going to develop multiple movements for it? And this has the character of the second movement of a symphony. Second movements of symphonies will have this type of sound, this type of texture, more than first movements. Um, so I don't know if you have it in you to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going on this and write three more movements and, and have a completed thing that I can call a symphony. But other, otherwise, you could call it a tone poem would be the uh, <laughs> that would be the term that to me feels most in in keeping with uh, the sound of this tone poem. Yeah. I never know. I might end up doing two or three more movements. That's what I'd like to do. Whether I've got cool. enough time or energy or skill is another matter. Yeah. And, well, you, the, the skill is, you, you, you got the skill. You just you, It's just a question of doing it and then feeling like you've got the energy to complete the thing and work these things out versus saying, oh, I'm working on this other thing, but now I'm not sure it's connected to that first thing. I just wanted to work on the second thing. And then you've got two separate tone poems or whatever, and that's fine too. Because um, if you're going to write a symphony, there is some expectation that the movements relate to each other in some way. The way that the movements of a symphony relate to each other is mm, mm -hmm. amorphous, is maybe the best word that I can uh, come up for. It, there's not a fixed way that, uh, oh, yes, we're definitely going to reuse the themes from the first movement in the second. But there's usually some reference to something about the first movement in sub in subsequent movements in sometimes very, very, very subtle ways. Um, 
so yeah, whether you whether you end up writing more movements for this or not, totally up to you. But yeah, this I I'm I've never written a full symphony. I've never written a full sonata like all movements because I I typically lose interest before I get there. <laughs> I don't lose interest in the project, but I become so interested in this new thing that I'm doing that I'm like, yeah, I don't want to have to tie it to that other thing I wrote. I just want to write this thing now and not worry about whether it's connected to that other. So um, anyhow, uh, I'll be interested to see if you end up uh, writing more movements for this or not. I don't, don't see why I should stop now. Yeah. All right, then. So, Thank um, you. Well, sure. Any other any other comments or questions about the uh, this uh, before we kind of wrap up this discussion? Well, it's 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 made me uh, do things like I've just listened to um, Brahms's first two mm. symphonies, nice. uh, looking at the music, and I've mm. I've found I can actually scan the score a little bit now and work out where things are going. Oh, not nice. that I'm not that I could be a conductor, but it's teaching me how to, to sight read a bit. So maybe that's a good thing. It's a great thing. And actually, I'll, I'll mention this again for everyone's benefit as a super practical thing. This, if you want to really test certain things about your ability to sort of process written music, do the following experiment. Get the score to a piece. Um, then find get a recording of the piece that that score goes to start the recording watch the score and then take your eyes off the score for a little bit you know go make yourself a snack whatever you know tie your shoes i don't care what you do distract yourself for 30 seconds a minute and then come back and try to find your place in the score that ability to track where you are in the score while you're listening and and so you're like okay now you're hearing oh I, you know i'm not i don't know what measure i'm on but here's what i'm hearing now let me flip pages and try to gauge how many pages forward do we think i just missed out on and oh i just heard that horn part where can i find that horn part there that's an amazing skill to develop and it's not like a specific skill that has a specific class associated with it that you study in a university but my gosh is it a practical skill so um, yeah, did you, did you by any chance uh, encounter any of that, Rod? Well, I was um, on YouTube. You can, there are plenty of places where they, the music and the, the, the um, they give you the score. There, yeah, yeah. And so you watched it. And I lost it a couple of times, and I thought, where the heck is that? And um, I, the other thing I did was I downloaded a PDF, so I had it on a separate screen while I was watching it. I was trying to read the music, and if I lost myself, I had to try mm -hmm. and find place and it's not that easy yeah it's not that easy but it's 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 something like i'll tell you where i get the most practice at that is um when i'm was teaching at a university and we would have what we call performance classes where you'd have a bunch it's basically like this you have students come on present some music and then uh, a couple of faculty members would comment on it and so i would participate as one of the faculty members at the performance classes and I would be handed the sheet music to the piece that they're playing. They're up on stage playing the piece and I'm following along on the sheet music. But then maybe I uh, hear something and I write some notes down and then they're still playing and then I go back to the sheet music and I need to find <laughs> where they are. And so that would come up often over and over again like you know I would I would be just doing that for an hour every few weeks and um, yeah, you develop you develop skills that are very kind of specialized to that setting, but it teaches you something about music and about the structure of the relationship of what you're seeing to what you're hearing, and that in turn internalizes to composition. Like the fact that I can look at this and say, oh yeah, you got the strings playing, most of the uh, the low brass and the percussion is silent. It's kind of it's a top heavy sound here, right? I, I hear upper woodwinds upper brass and strings. So instantly I kind of know what that sounds like and I know that that's a familiar thing. I'm like, oh yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that before in other scores and now when I go to write something, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll probably write I'll probably use that thing. I'll probably use this thing of using the upper woodwinds, the upper brass and the strings together because I know that's a thing and Beethoven used it in this piece and Mozart used it in that piece, etc. So just that idea of looking at a score at that 
again, big picture sort of way, um, it teaches us something about composition. Yep. I think I've taken up enough of your time. And I all thank right. you for all the comments. I, I think um, it's exactly what I wanted. All right, great. And yeah, I know you've uh, you. It's super early or super late for you, one or the other. So uh, I have you know, no idea. Get some, get some more get some more sleep, Rod. All right. Thanks thank again for much. being here. So, by by the way, can you just let me know? Do you see a button that you can press that says that you're that to to check out of this? Like that says like leave because uh, you don't want to leave. Don't want to leave. No, thank you. But you just don't need. To, I know I can uh, de co-host you, but you don't have a button that you see no, that I can't will see anything like that. Uh, that's no. fine. I'm going to remember to request that because it it seems like it would be useful. But yep. I'm going to then just uh, thank you again for the music. Thanks for your time. Glad that you got everything uh, kind of working together again. More or less. And uh, yeah, more or less. And uh, look forward to hearing some more music. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> All right. So um, yeah, some absolutely wonderful music there. Glad we got to uh, to hear that and have that. Um, discussion there. So earlier I mentioned that uh, I want to tell you a little bit about some perseverance. This is just a little motivational uh, speech that I'm going to give you. It's not a worked out speech. It's just some thoughts I've had. <coughs> and part of it relates to um, actually even just what Rod was talking about, about having the computer problem that you work through and eventually get fixed, or me having my computer problem that I work through and get fixed. Sometimes, you know, there's problems that it's really easy to give up on. It's really easy to get frustrated and give up on something and uh, just sort of say, yeah, because of this problem, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go anywhere. And I want to try to inspire people to not give up. All right, so I'm going to tell you just a couple of little stories about the not giving up thing. All right, so the first one is one that many of you have probably heard before. It's a classic story of, of a, a, a letter to, um, actually, I don't even know how the story ends, but a, a letter to, I think it was Ann Landers, you know, the advice columnist. There's Dear Abby and Ann Landers' uh, sisters, and I think this was. I think it was Ann Landers. And there was a, a famous letter that was written, and I'm going to butcher the story, but y'all, if you know the story, you'll, you can correct me. But the gist of it is someone wrote in and said, you know, I really think, I'm really thinking of going back to college or going to med school or doing this thing because um, I really want to become a nurse or whatever it is they wanted to do. And, you know, I, 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 I kind of think it might be something I want to do, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, you know, 43 years old. And by the time I come through this, it's going to take eight years. Um, by the time I come through this, I'm going to be 51. So is it worth doing? And Anne's reply was, yeah, how old are you going to be in eight years if you don't do it? <laughs> I just love that, right? The time's going to go by either way, whether you work on the thing you think that you want to work on or not, the time's going to go by. It doesn't matter if it's going to take eight years. Um, if it's going to take eight years, your life's going to take eight years anyhow, whether you spend it working on becoming a nurse or whether you spend it working on writing a symphony or not, those eight years are going to go by. Why not actually spend it doing this thing that, that you're dreaming of doing, right? So, so that's one bit about this perseverance thing. It's about setting a goal and realizing that even if it takes a long time to get to that goal, that time's going to happen anyhow. So why not spend some of it working on the goal, right? Um, so now I want to give you two kind of specific examples of, of stories that I, you know, firsthand experience kind of stories. One is one that uh, it just, it gets my, it, 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 it really affected me deeply. And I remember it so vividly when I was in college, when I was like, a freshman in college, like 40 years ago, almost, um, I lived in the, in the freshman dorm and there was a piano there. And, you know, I used to play the piano, practice there sometimes. There's a couple other people who practiced the piano there sometimes. Um, I mean, there was the music school also, the music building. You could go practice there. But it was nice having a piano there in the dorm. And sometimes people would just get together and just jam and play and whatnot. And there was one girl there. Her name was Laura. Like L O R A, Laura. Um, and Laura was not a pianist. She didn't read music, 
hadn't taken piano lessons that I know of, but she had it in her head that she was going to play Send in the Clowns. You know that song? Um, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I haven't played the things, but it's got arpeggios in the left hand, and then... Isn't it rich? Isn't it dead? Anyhow, that's how the song goes. Um, um, so it's got this melody, uh, Stephen Stonheim song, I think. Um, and she got some help from me and one of the other pianists there t- teaching her. She had the sheet music for it. And she got some help. Uh, figuring out how to read the notes, like you know, we wrote in the every good boy does fine or whatever the note, the, the things with the lines, and then she would write in the notes for every single note in there, and she would work on that thing every day over the course of of, of the course of the school year, and just practice, like like it would be like. I mean, painfully slow, measure by measure. She would spend a week working out one measure and then practicing that measure over and over again. And then the next week, work on the next measure. And the next week, work on... I mean, literally, it would be like a week per... I mean, maybe it was, maybe it was four days per... Or maybe it was she did two measures at a time and spent six days on it. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was an incredibly, incredibly slow process. But... The piece is only, you know, 60 measures long. I don't know how long it is. Um, uh, By the end of the school year, she could play the piece. She couldn't do anything else. She didn't didn't read music any better. She didn't, you know, it's not like when she goes to play another piece, she's suddenly going to be able to be this great pianist or anything. But by God, she set a goal for herself. I'm going to play Send in the Clowns. And one measure at a time worked it out. And, you know, it's not like she did nothing else. She went to her classes. She was a good student, did uh, did her stuff, had a social life, did did everything. But, you know, when she could find the time, she would spend, you know, an hour Every few days, just working, or maybe sometimes it was just 20 minutes or whatever, but she would work on that, and she, by the end of the school year, could play Sen and the Clowns. And to me, this remains, in the 50-something years I've been alive, one of the single most impressive <laughs> bits of human achievement that I've ever witnessed was Laura Doty uh, learning Send in the Clowns and in in college. I mean, it was it's like this inspired me in so many ways to say, yeah, there's things that I can do also that maybe I'm never going to be great at, but I, if I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. So now I'm going to tell you one other little story, and then we'll sign off. Um, so you, some of you have heard me mention that uh, you know I uh, got a, a new bicycle recently, been getting back into bicycling, something I used to do more of. And um, uh, it's a three-speed bike, so it's not really well set up for like climbing steep hills or anything. And I live in Colorado, which those of you, you know, people know it's a mountainous state, but where I live, I mean, it's, Denver is relatively flat, but we're right next to the mountains, right? So there's, there's plenty of hills around, although a lot of it's flat, but there's one mountain in particular called Lookout Mountain, not a very tall mountain, but it's sort of a famous ride. It's like all it is, it's been part of major bicycle races and things where people want to climb up Lookout Mountain. And it's not the steepest thing in the world, it's not the longest thing in the world, but it's sort of this combination of kind of steep and kind of long. Things that are longer are typically not as steep, things that are steeper are typically not as long. And so it has this sort of reputation as sort of a rite of passage for serious bicyclists. Well, I'm not a serious bicyclist any more than Laura was a serious pianist. But she wanted to play Send in the Clowns. I wanted to climb Lookout Mountain. So I uh, worked a little bit on climbing hills. I'd I'd find hills around here that are sort of similar uh, steepness and practice seeing how far I could go up them without having to stop for a breath. Or, you know, could I go on and climb the hill a second time? You know, did I, would it just like rip everything out of me just to climb that hill? And at some point decided I was ready to do it. And Monday, that's what I did. I, um, 
I took the day Monday and climbed up Lookout Mountain on my bike. And when I say I took the day, I mean, I didn't literally take all day, but uh, I took a couple hours and I would like ride two minutes, rest two minutes, ride two minutes, rest two minutes. Because I knew I could ride two minutes at a time up a steep hill because I've done that before. I practiced it. Ride two minutes, rest two minutes, ride two minutes, rest two minutes. A couple hours later, I was at the top of the mountain. So didn't set any speed records or anything, but... I did something that I set out to do, and I was kind of proud of it anyhow, even though a serious bicyclist would look at that uh, as nothing. But no, it's it's it, it, this is the kind of stuff that I want to see people being inspired by to say, yes, if there's something you want to do, you can do it. Rod, you wrote yourself a symphony, right? I climbed a mountain, right? I mean, th- you can do these things. So let's, let's take inspiration and... Uh, and achieve some things. All right. That's my perseverance story for you. Hope you enjoyed. Oh, it was a blast coming down. Absolutely. It was a blast going down. Um, all right. So I want to thank everyone, uh, for being here. Thanks for your comments and so forth. And I am now going to be, uh, getting on with some things. We're, you know, continuing to work on Music Word 4 stuff, trying to get it ready for, uh, um, uh, getting ready for a beta release and I'm still trying to get, you know, documentation together, my course together, so lots of stuff going on for me. But all those things that I asked about earlier, keep those in mind and I'm going to ask about them again in the community, you know, what kind of stuff you might want to see uh, going forward from me as far as jazz piano holiday course, music engraving workshop, musicianship skills, music core four course. What can I be doing to help you all out? So, anyhow, Have a great week. See you next time.